Well, let us stand together.
Well, it is a special pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, a friend. This is his first time, memory serves me right, to preach here at our church, but very thankful to have Pastor Paul Laney with us this weekend. Paul has served as pastor of Grace Community Church in Huntsville, Alabama uh, since 2002. He serves as campus pastor uh, for the Expositor Seminary. One of the campuses of the Expositor Seminary is uh, located uh, at their church. And with the seminary, he teaches courses in pastoral ministry, Bible exposition, systematic theology. He's been a regular writing contributor with uh, ACBC, the Master's Seminary Journal, the Journal of Modern Ministry, Christianity.com, and ChurchPastor.com. But what I really want to say is, having gotten to know Paul, I just admire him as a pastor. He's a faithful shepherd, loves the Lord's church, rock solid in his views of what it means to, to pastor the Lord's church, what it means, you know, ecclesiology, what it means to be the Lord's church. So very grateful to have him here this weekend. Please join me in welcoming Paul Lamy. Well, welcome to the afternoon lunch, after lunch uh, session. This is the carb session where you, uh, I'm praying that your, your uh, New Year's resolutions to cut back on carbs is going to pay off <laughs> right here, right now. Uh, I'm excited to be here with you this afternoon and welcome you back. This is a, a great opportunity and a great conference. It's a great subject. I want to thank you, Richard, for having me here, brother. I, I so much appreciate you and your faithfulness here. Thank you for putting this conference on. Uh, this is a, a very much needed topic and discussion, isn't it? Uh, suffering. And um, as we think about this, let, let's go ahead and take our Bibles and turn to Romans 5. We're going to park ourselves there this afternoon in Romans 5. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 5 and, and zero in on the last couple of verses of that text. But it is a, a noteworthy topic suffering. And in a crowd this size, at this moment, there is a panoply of suffering in this room. The physical pains in some of your bodies on some days are unbearable and overwhelming to your day. Some of you are going to leave this conference and you're going to go home to an unbelieving spouse. And you know a level of suffering that few others do. Some of you have wayward children that you have prayed for and sought and who it seemingly at one point loved the Lord but walked away from the faith or shunned the faith and, and are now gone. Some of you are considering the cost of moving to 
difficult places for the sake of the gospel. There will be suffering there. There are pastors here that pour out their souls week in, week out. They absorb arrows for their congregation and they languish in obscurity. They know a level of suffering. There's all kinds of suffering that is going on here just in this room. And my goal this afternoon is to remind us of God's purposes in these situations and help us understand what it means to rejoice in suffering. And I did not misspeak just now. Rejoice in suffering. Do you believe that? I want you to notice our text this afternoon, Romans 5. I want to read our passage, Romans 5, verses 1 through 5, and then we're going to spend some time looking at this. The Apostle Paul says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulations bring perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, since we're parachuting into chapter 5, it's important for you to understand a little bit of of how we got here, what, what happened up to this point in Romans. And in the first four chapters, Paul explains the centrality of the gospel message as our only hope. Back in chapter 1, Paul seeks to explain the gospel in the face of opposition and much misunderstanding. And the gospel message, he goes on to show us, is the means that God has chosen to reconcile lost humanity to himself. There's nothing else. There's no hope without it. And he starts out right there in the first two verses of chapter 1 saying that Jesus is the gospel. Jesus is our only hope. And then at the end of chapter 1, verse 18 through chapter 3, verse 20, it's a, it's a section. He, he shows, and he goes to great lengths to show that all human beings, all of us, every single one of us apart from Christ, have rebelled and are helpless under the power of sin. If you are without Christ right now, you are in rebellion against God. You are under the power of sin And without Christ, each one of us lives under the tyranny of our own sinful disposition in nature. Paul goes to great lengths to show that. And then he shows that our only hope for this situation is those wonderful words. And and you can read them there if you look back at chapter 3, verse 24. The only hope for our situation, he says there so clearly, so wonderfully, is being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. That is a loaded verse, isn't it? This new relationship with God is is open to all who believe in Jesus. It cannot be attained by works. It cannot be attained by circumcision. It cannot be attained by family connections, by football or political affiliations. Not ethnicity, Now, whether you're a male or a female, it is is open to all. It's available for all and only to those who believe by faith in Jesus because of his sovereign grace. That is the message of the first four chapters of Romans. Now in chapters 5, beginning in 5 through chapters 8, he begins a new section. And in chapters 5 through 8, Paul explains the benefits of the gospel for those who have believed in Jesus, which is what he says right there in the opening words of verse 1. John, Mur- John Murray, the theologian, he calls this chapter the, the blessings of justification. Paul has gone to great lengths in the first four chapters to show what justification is, how it works, uh, what it's not. And now he shows us the blessings for those who are justified, those who are made right, declared righteous in the sight of God through the work of Christ alone by faith alone. These are the blessings of justification. And the purpose of this is to bolster your confidence in what God has done for you as you live in this fallen world. The central expression of response to this we see in our text here. Look back at verse 2 now. 
we exult, we rejoice, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. And then again in verse 3, we exult, we rejoice, we boast also in our tribulations. This is to be the believer's posture to this great work of God. It's, in a word, rejoicing. However, I'm afraid what Paul calls us to rejoice in is greatly out of season at this point in time in the church. Have you thought about this? I suspect that the message of the modern church is is radically out of step with the Bible's teaching on suffering. The evangelical church is largely clueless when it comes to this. Uh, Let me give you a silly picture. I I know no one here watches football, right? Right, Pastor? Pastor? Uh, Well, you don't have to anymore, right? (laughs) Listen, I'm an Auburn fan. There's always next year, all right? (laughs) But have you noticed when when the quarterback, he, he sees an opening and he makes a line and he goes right to the end zone and he throws a pass or he himself walks right into the end zone. Uh, what, what do they all do? They, they, they make the touchdown, the referee makes the, the, the signal and, and then the, the quarterback or whoever runs the ball in, they point up to the sky. I come from the defensive side of the ball where one of the greatest things in the world to, for me is to come right off the edge and destroy that quarterback. But here's what you never see. You never see when that quarterback is pummeled. You never see him when he is down. You don't see him get up and point to the sky. He only does it when he scores a touchdown. Instead, what you see is he blames his offensive line or he says the ref, you know, they should have called roughing the passer or something like that. This is exactly the way Christians live their lives at times. A mere superficial homage to a remote deity. And when things are going well, we point up, it's all him. Glory to God. That's true. It is. Don't stop doing that. But what about the other times? Uh, Let's interview a couple. We'll call them Mr. and Mrs. Job, for example. Mrs. Job says to Mr. Job, you know what you need to do? You need to curse God and die. If we read that text rightly, she might be suggesting you just need to off yourself. You need to take yourself out. You know what Mr. Job says to his wife? Shall we indeed accept good from God and not adversity? The Bible puts two truths together without any contradiction whatsoever. You can be full of joy and peace in Christ while at the same time experiencing the sanctifying hand of suffering and difficulty and even tribulation. God has ordained his world and your life in such a way that it is his plan for you to experience suffering and various kinds of trials so that your life will be transformed. That's his plan. Why? So that you will be better positioned for sanctifying purposes. Now, friends, my telling you that should not lead you to despair and misery, but it should galvanize your hope in the work that God is accomplishing in and around and through you and in our church. The Apostle Paul shows us here that the Christian faith is unintelligible apart from a biblical understanding of suffering. So how does this work in this text before us? And what is Paul's theology of suffering here? I want to walk us across this with really three focal points, and each one builds, and all three go, go together very, very uh, uniquely and wonderfully in the Apostle Paul's logic here. The first focal point, number one, is we can rejoice in the peace we've been granted. How do we navigate suffering? How do we rejoice in our suffering? Number one, rejoice in the peace we've been granted. This is what he says there in verse one. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you stopped for a moment to consider the granting of peace that has come to you as a child of God? 
For Paul to say that in verse 1 means that something was radically askew, something was radically wrong before he granted peace to us in Christ. In my city back in Alabama, years ago, there was a church that put up a billboard, and, and I believe the intentions were hopefully good, but uh, it was certainly wrong-headed theologically and biblically, and the billboard said this, God's not mad at you no matter what. Really? As I read the Bible, it says God is angry with the wicked all day long. God's not mad at you no matter what. Unbelievers and, and we before Christ, we were at war with God. We were at enmity with God. We hated God. We hated each other. We mask it with smiles, but we are at war with God and his creation and everyone else. God is righteous in his wrath and God is righteous as a judge. To be angry at sin and sinners because they are in rebellion against him. If God is not opposed to sinners in their natural state, if God is going to save everyone regardless of what they do, then why, pray tell here in verse 1, do we need peace with him? Why was the cross necessary if everything's okay? If you go back to Pastor Richard's generation, if Jesus is just all right with me right? Think about it this way. The current presence of peace in your life means that before Christ, this did not characterize your relationship to him. You were at war. You may not have felt at war, but you were at war. The word therefore there at the beginning of verse one, it's doing a lot of work here. And here we have a significant turning point in Romans and Paul is summing up the central teaching of the first four chapters, having been justified by faith. That is a massive statement there. But now he pivots to how this great truth is a present blessing to our lives as believers in Christ. Paul is summing up the central teachings here. It's as if, as if Paul was answering his own question. In light of the first four chapters, so what, Paul? So what difference does justification make? He says there in verse 1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, in your suffering, would you not read quickly over those words? But would you linger there? You have peace with God. That's something, isn't it? You were at war and now you have peace. Why? Because of justification. We've been cleared of all charges. You have peace. Now that word peace there in verse 1, it's a very elastic uh, term in our common English. It's come to mean just about anything, right? It's not just a, a mere cessation of hostilities like Joshua entering a treaty of peace with the Gibeonites. It's not some sense of well-being or prosperity. You know how we say, well, I have a peace about it. You know how that phrase just shuts down everything now? I, I plead with this man, you, you, you cannot leave your wife. This is dishonoring to the Lord. Well, God's given me a peace about it. That's no peace at all. That's not what Paul is saying here. More accurately, what he describes is an objective state, not a sub subjective emotion. It is the outworking of being in a right relationship with God because of union with Christ. Here's what he says there in verse 1. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who brokered our peace. Through here signifies the agency through whom the peace is achieved. This is huge. It also rules out any other attempts. Listen, friends, it rules out any other attempts to find peace and satisfaction apart from him, whether without Christ or even in your suffering. If hostilities were ended because you have now peace with Christ, don't try to find peace some other way now that you're in Christ. Peace here is not a feeling. It's not a settled resignation to our circumstances. Well, I guess things are just bad. It's not an inner enlightenment. It's not found in having your sin affirmed by others. But Paul says here, it's a position that we've been granted in Christ Jesus. 
There is no peace without coming to terms with God through Jesus. The believer's current position of peace is further described there in verse 2. Look at it. Through whom also we have obtained an introduction or access by faith into this grace in which we stand. This is a present and continuing situation of the believer, a present and continuing posture for the believer. Now, the New American Standard, which I read here, it translates this as introduction. We have obtained our introduction. It makes it sound like this is the event of salvation. Now, that's true in one sense. Our introduction into salvation is, is and only through Christ. But here, he is speaking of the nature of an ongoing access that we have. Now that we're in Christ, he's covered the fact that we're in Christ in the first four chapters. Here, he's not talking about just our access to God, how you get in. He's talking about the nature of our relationship now that we are in. It would be true to say that we have unfettered access to God through Christ, but that's not the point that Paul's making here in verse 2. It's not just access, but notice As his children, we now have access into, look, this grace. The grace that saves you is the grace in which you stand as a believer. Paul uses the word grace in different ways all throughout Romans. And here it's not the manner in which God acts toward us, but it's the state, it's the position that we now reside in as his sons and daughters. We're not in darkness as believers. We're not under the law. We're not in bondage. But we are living right now as believers in Christ who have union with Christ. We are living in a state of grace. He will say down in verse 21 that we are living as God's beloved under the reign of grace. Sin once reigned in your life and mine, but now grace presides over us in Christ. So here in verse 2, this is not the grace of salvation, but more specifically, it is the grace of sanctification. You need grace for both, right? What this means is that the dominant, that grace is the dominant characteristic of our new status as believers. Now, how do we know that that's what Paul means here? Well, this is why Paul clarifies this with a, not that this grace is not only that that brought us in, but this is the grace, look at verse 2 again, in which we stand. This is currently. We entered by grace. We now stand in grace. This is the, really at the backbone of what Paul addresses also in Galatians. You came in by the work of the Spirit and the work of God's grace. Why do you think you need to stand and, and exist as a believer some other way now? We entered by grace. We stand in grace. His grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Now, so far, Paul has been talking about our current situation, but now he looks ahead and we we see a second focal point at the end of verse 2. First, we can rejoice in the peace we've been granted. Secondly, we can rejoice in the hope we've been given. Both of these you're going to see are foundational to the overall posture of how we're going to assess our tribulations and sufferings. But number two, we can rejoice in the hope we've been given. Look at the end of verse two. And we exult, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We have a peace with Christ that not only looks back, but it also looks forward. Now, this is a key statement for Paul in this chapter. In fact, he'll return to it again and again, this this theme of hope. But here he says, notice, that it can be translated a few different ways as boast or exult or rejoice. The idea is of of confidence, expressive confidence of the heart, a settled love and hope in what God has done. But here it's a joyful confidence in God's gracious provision that is encouraged. It's joyful confidence in view of how God will bring all things together when we, on that day, behold him in his glory. Paul says our hope has a future orientation. Do you see how this is starting to work? 
And, and number one, we see that there is a, a, an anchor that causes us to look back at the cross and the work of the cross and how there continue to be benefits of the cross even into our Christian life. And now not only that, but there's also a, a peeking ahead. What's to come? Paul says it's glory. What is this glory here? This glory is the full unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ in all his glory. It is the presence of God through Jesus, his reigning son, with his people, in his kingdom. The peaceful spiritual position that we enjoy now will one day, friends, it will one day give way to a fully realized presence of the king as we see him and know him in the fullness of his glory. Do you ever think about heaven? Do you ever think about the eternal state? Do you ever think about the new heavens and the new earth and what it will be like to be with the Lord? Encourage one another with these words. We shall always be together with him. Glory. The peaceful spiritual position that we enjoy will one day be seen in its fullness. We shall see him as he is. In Genesis 49, Jacob saw a descendant of Judah who would be the Messiah, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. All the honor, all the glory would be given to him. That's in Genesis, before we even get to the end of the book. Balaam said, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A scepter will arise from Israel, a ruling king in all of his glory. Daniel saw the Son of Man coming in full glory and in his kingdom, a kingdom without end. What did Jesus believe? Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Well, what difference does that make right now? You're going home to an unbelieving spouse. You have friends, you have missionaries that you're praying for and supporting and loving and you've got, uh, that you know are suffering in various places. You, you've got, you, your heart is just rended in two with all manner of situations. How does this truth shape my understanding of suffering now? Well, in Romans, this concept of the hope of the glory of God is aimed at the future with a view to shaping how we live now. Phil mentioned this this morning in Romans 8. In Romans 8, verse 18, Paul says, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with what? With the glory that is to be revealed to us. It's a heavenly eternal perspective that we all need in the midst of suffering. They used to say, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. I'm afraid we're not heavenly minded at all. Paul says here in verse two, this is our hope. It's the central cause for rejoicing. The glory of Christ. It doesn't get any better than that. We long for, we anticipate that day. And so we rejoice in the peace we have with God and we long for a day when our hope is realized, all of which brings our present discussion of suffering into this final focal point. As you suffer, dwell on the fact that it will end. There will be a day in which every tear will be wiped away. Every disease will be healed. Every war will be snuffed out. All of this is leading to this final point here. We can rejoice, number three, we can rejoice in the tribulations we are experiencing. You can rejoice in the tribulations you are experiencing. The peace we have with God comes through our union with Christ. We have been justified, made right through Jesus. However, we now see that this peace is tested. It is proved. Where? In the refinery of tribulations. Paul anticipates someone objecting. Paul, how can you say we have peace Right now, when so many believers are enduring tremendous suffering and illness and persecution and so many difficulties of all kinds, how can you say we have peace? 
Paul, don't present sufferings outweigh and overturn the realities of future glory. How can I think about the glory of that day when I have to face the sorrows of this one? Paul says in verse 3, and not only this, not only the heavenly perspective, but we also exult, we rejoice in our tribulations. That, my friends, is a hard statement, isn't it? Not only do our sufferings not overshadow all blessings, but they are actually, Paul says, an occasion for even more confident joy and exultation. There is something in me that wars against what I just read here. There is something in my imperfect humanness, my atomness, if we can create a word here, that longs to have the, the glory of the future with Christ, listen, without the tribulations that Christ uses to sanctify me now. I want that without this. I want heaven without sanctification. I want glory without any of the sufferings that preceded. If you look there at verse 3, how we interpret the prepositions matter here. Paul doesn't mean that we rejoice in tribulations in themselves. Let me clarify this. This doesn't mean that we rejoice in cancer or we rejoice in the loss of a job or the death of a precious loved one. God hates those things that are not part of his original creation. The fallenness, the groaning will one day be eradicated completely by him. No, we don't rejoice in those things. It's been a few years now. When my children were one, three, five, and seven, I was given some hard news. The doctor looked at me and he said, your wife has stage 3C colon cancer. And within a few millimeters, that tumor would be outside the colon and she would have stage four and there would be no hope, medically speaking. And praise the Lord, she is in remission. But when we were given the news of my wife's cancer, we didn't throw a party. We wept. We cried out to God. What does Paul mean by rejoicing in our tribulations? The word Paul uses here marks the object to show us that we can rejoice in and among so many tribulations and trials. So the sense of what Paul says here is that we rejoice, get this and listen, in the midst of such afflictions. Our joy, our peace, our hope in the work that God is accomplishing. Listen, this is so encouraging. It's not swallowed up by tribulation. Rather, these things are strengthened and refined in our trials. What are the tribulations here that Paul speaks of? Well, he doesn't define it, does he? It would just be sufferings of all kinds and varieties. It's kind of like Dr. MacArthur last night talking about the uh, Paul's thorn in the flesh. We can make guesses and possibly a messenger and maybe a human being with false doctrine, but at the end of the day, we don't know for sure. We don't know for sure what all of this will entail, and that's because it may entail all sorts of things. But one thing is clear, according to Paul, suffering is a normal part of the Christian life. You want to plan a church? Any church planners here? Right after Paul planted churches in Acts 14, you know what he did? He sent out flyers and said, we're going to have a launch service. And he sent these throughout all of Asia Minor. No, that's not what he did. In Acts 14, right after he planted the churches, he warned the new converts, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. That's his first church planting message to the new converts. Jesus said in John 16, in this world, you will have trouble. Paul says in 
Philippians 1.29, for to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. This is a part of it. This is what God is using to refine your faith, to strengthen you. We could go on and talk about the many purposes of suffering. We're not always sure how God will use them, but we are sure that he will. When we were given that news about my wife's cancer, we had no idea the many joys and the various trials that God would take us through that he would use to strengthen our faith, but also give us many opportunities to share the gospel with so many people. To point our children to Christ, that their hope is not in the health of their mom or their dad, but it is in Christ alone. There's all kinds of suffering. We could categorize this. There's, on one hand, there's what I would call fallen world suffering. These are just the fallen aspects of this world that's in utter chaos and ruin. This is everything from car accidents to disease to fevers in the night. It's just all part of it. It's a fallen world that's suffering. Paul will say later in Romans 8 that this world is groaning. Our bodies are groaning as well. Another kind would be gospel tribulations or gospel sufferings. This is where people will suffer for the sake of the gospel. Jesus said insults, persecutions, false statements will be waged against Christians. He said that in Matthew 5. And he said, don't be shocked at that. You're blessed. Fallen world suffering, gospel tribulations, gospel sufferings, they're sanctifying suffering. And I think this is what Paul has in aim primarily here in this passage tribulations that God uses to accomplish the sanctification of his people. And he'll use those first two in that. It is suffering that is aimed at spiritual growth. We all want to be physically fit without hard work. We all want learnedness without study. And we all want sanctification without the trials that make it so. Sanctification without suffering is like trying to make furniture from a tree without sandpaper and saws. Sanctification is the process and suffering is God's righteous sandpaper. It's his pruning shears. This is what God will use and he does use. Paul now argues that our present sufferings, whatever they may be, when assessed rightly in the light of what God has done and is doing, rightly will produce valuable spiritual benefits that will shape your life for now and eternity. Look what he says at the, in the second half there, verse 3b. Knowing this, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Perseverance, uh, translated also as endurance or steadfastness. This is spiritual fortitude that, that bears up under the strain. My son is, uh, my oldest son is a student at Auburn. I don't know what the outcome of the game is. Hopefully it's good. But they just played Kentucky and he camped out all night long to watch a stupid basketball game. But he's an aerospace engineering student and I don't understand anything that he's doing. But he took a class called engineering physics. And in engineering physics, this is where they, they, they test things with force and load and it's applied with the result that, that uh, we can test where things are weak and, and where the strain is. And it reveals where the issues are. And we're thankful for that, especially in bridges and buildings and cars and all those kind of things. But there's also a, what Paul talks about here is a spiritual physics that is at work where force and load are applied with the result that the believer is made stronger by the suffering. I like what the old King James says. Tribulation worketh patience. Tribulation worketh patience. Do you ever pray for patience? I have four teenagers. I'll just let you figure that out. They're such a blessing. But if we're honest, when we say that we're praying for patience, patience, what we're really saying is, I want patience, I want perseverance without the difficulties that will accomplish this. I just want the end result. That's, 
how I often think. Maybe it's just me. Paul says it is a, the challenging situation that will actually accomplish the very thing that you want. It's the difficulty, it's, it's the trial, it's the suffering, it's the pressure, it's the vigorous stirring that will create the sanctification that is necessary and needed. Go with me on a very silly illustration here for a second. Imagine your beloved asks you, would you like eggs for breakfast? You say, yes, that, that would be nice, that would be wonderful. And you come to the table only to find three uncooked eggs on a plate. Still in their shell, just sitting there. And that's obviously silly, but there's an implicit understanding in the question that was originally asked. That we, we husbands and wives, we can just communicate that way. It's amazing, isn't it? Would you like eggs? There's an understanding of what that means. But there's an implicit understanding that to receive the final and complete product, what's going to have to happen? Those eggs will need to get cracked open. They will have to lose what won't make it into the final product. You don't want shells in the final product. They will have to be stirred. They may even, yea, verily, have to be whisked vigorously. I'm afraid that what we often pray for when we pray for patience, what we're really saying is that we want patience without the tribulations that form the recipe of the final product. We want the final product without being whisked vigorously, without being cracked open in a few places, without losing some shell. We want to hold on. Paul showed us in verse 2 that our sufferings ultimately point to the glory, but also we see in verses 3 and 4 that suffering leads, this is wonderful, to maturity. What he calls perseverance, endurance, steadfastness. Not only can we rejoice in the midst of such things, but you can even rejoice because you know what this will accomplish in you and your church. The maturing effect of, and, and the congregational effect of our maturing together and our tribulations creates a path for longevity and ministry and usefulness, and this produces even more maturity. You want to see a healthy church? It will be a church that suffers and goes through sufferings together. We walk through tribulations together. That's a healthy church. The participle there in verse 3, knowing, it gives the reason or the basis for this. And what Paul is doing, he drops a truth bomb here. There's no warm-up. There's no preamble. Just know this. Whatever afflictions await you, beloved, whatever distresses may come, you must know this. It will increase your spiritual endurance. Paul says here that our sufferings, whatever they may be, create a a chain reaction of sanctified fruits. And it continues in verse 4. And this perseverance, this endurance, look next, proven character and proven character, there's our word again, hope. Proven character. This is tested character. This is God refining your life at times in the furnace of varied afflictions. A young couple comes to me and they, they get married and they go through premarital counseling and, and everything's perfect. It's, it's the perfect premarital counseling. It's the perfect ceremony. It's the, the pastor was a spot on. It's, everything's great. Everything's perfect. Perfect honeymoon. And, and all of that's just going so wonderfully and they are perfect for each other. And then they come to me six months later. <laughs> and one or both of them, they, they are aghast at the sin. I say aghast at the sin of the other person. (laughs) They're just now learning, albeit painfully at times and, and seriously at times. They're learning what some of us have been learning for a while now, and that is that there are still areas of your life and your marriage and ways of thinking that are not yet sanctified. And character and your love is revealed in the furnace of those kind of afflictions. 
The believer now has new eyes to see that God is using our suffering to bring about even greater blessing and refinement. That's what Paul is talking about. It's an entirely different way of of viewing our ongoing struggles. We don't always have an answer for that question. Why is this happening? We, We don't always know that. But we can ask, how is God using this to refine my character? How is he using this to refine my attitude, my my disposition, my outlook, my focus, and my response to those around me? How is he using this to provide more ministry in my church? How is he using this for for me to speak the gospel to that lost neighbor, that person that needs to hear about the love of Christ and his grace? Paul wants us each to see that whatever the sufferings we endure in this life, they're not pointless. It's actually pointing to various truths and reminders all along the way. One of the great theologians on Romans uh, is Douglas Moo, who's written thousands of pages, three different commentaries, thousands of pages, lots of books on Romans and Paul and so many things. He's been a a treasure and and a gift to the church. There was a comment that I came across almost buried in one of those where he just says, after meditating on this very passage, he says, I sometimes wish I could mature in Christ the way I should without having to suffer. But I know in my heart that I am not just built, I am just not built that way and that only suffering will pry me from this world and its pleasures. That's a good theologian. They're following the text. Only suffering will pry me from this world and its pleasures. That's proven character. Finally, here in verse 5, this hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Here's our word again, hope. Hope is the focal point of this passage. There's a golden chain of hope that is woven throughout this passage. For those who know Jesus, verse 2, we we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Verse 4, tested character will refine our hope. And now we see in verse 5, this hope will not leave us despondent with shame. Hope and suffering began in verse 1 with our salvation. And that same love that saved you now sustains you in suffering. Paul is saying here something very important, that when suffering comes, it's vital that our convictions not wash away with our trials. We have all these strong convictions about so many things, and then trials come, and we're like, I don't know if I know anything anymore. That we must hold to our hope in Christ. Calvin said, there are times when we feel as if we are pulled apart by a double will but we do not lose hope. Hope, Paul says, does not disappoint. It does not put to shame. The, the, the phrase there means cause to be ruined or lost. Your hope in Christ will not ruin you. Your hope in your suffering, you will not be ruined. You will not be lost. Why can we have this kind of gospel confidence in the midst of such things? Paul says at the end of verse five, because the love of God has been poured out. Now, Paul is not referring to our love for God, but the love that God has for us. Also note carefully here in verse 5, look at it there in your text, that it's not the Holy Spirit that's poured out on this point, but it is the love of God. It's very interesting how Paul words all of this here. The Holy Spirit is the agent of God's love in Christ. God is constantly sustaining you through the person and work of the Holy Spirit who continually points us to the all-sufficient work of Christ. The good news is that this has nothing to do with how you feel or I feel about the Holy Spirit or sensing his presence, whatever that is. It just is. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is what he does. I can tell you that some of the richest times of remembering, knowing, and relishing God's love have been when I felt nothing at all. I'm so glad it was not according to my feelings or sensing something. In such times where it seems like everything was stripped away, all hope in humanity, all hope in my situation was lost. 
I had the Lord. All I have are the promises that God has given to us by his Holy Spirit and his word. And that's all you need. Do you believe that? Practically, this means regardless of how we feel, how sick, how low, how desperate, how painful the suffering may be, the promise is that God, look at it here in verse 5, he will uphold each and every one of his children through his Holy Spirit with his love, and he will pour out his love into your life. It's an act of love and care that is initiated by God, sustained by God, and accomplished by God, and seen to the end by God. How are we going to make it? I have no idea, but God is going to see us through. This is why you will never be disappointed with what God provides for you. You will be disappointed if your hope is in man. You will be disappointed if your hope is in your doctor. You will be disappointed if your hope is in the systems of this world. You will never be disappointed with what God has chosen to provide for you. So we can rejoice in the midst of our varied sufferings. Well, how can we do that? Let's ask ourselves here some questions at the end. Kind of a pop quiz here at the end of the sermon. Has God poured out his love? Has this love been secured by our union with Christ by his work on the cross? Has this love been lovingly granted to each one of us by the agency of his spirit? Yes. When that and these central truths are understood, then we will have a new perspective on suffering. We'll learn to see our suffering. It it can actually be three things. It can be evangelistic. There will be a witness in your suffering. It can be doxological. There is a, a, a new, renewed worship in your suffering. Did you know that? We start to ask questions when we suffer that we didn't ask before. We start, we start to cry out to God and seek the Lord in ways that we didn't before. That's doxological. Suffering is sanctifying is what we've seen here in our text as well. It's evangelistic, it's doxological, and it's sanctifying. You will grow through this. Piper said this, he said, God never wastes the gift of suffering. It is given to his people as he knows best and it's his design. Its design is the consolation and salvation of people. No suffering is senseless. No pain is pointless. No adversity is absurd and meaningless. Every heartache has its divine target in the consolation of the saints, even when we feel least useful. I leave you with this, brothers and sisters. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Or what about this? For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. May the Lord use his word to bless you and strengthen you. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its power. We thank you for how you will use it in our lives to to strengthen, to shape to move us to greater obedience, to awaken us out of our slumber, and even to bring some from death to life, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your beloved son. We pray, Lord, that you would have your way with us through the power of your word and the power of your spirit. For your name's sake, for the good of your church, 
And Father, I pray for these dear saints, especially so many who are suffering in a variety of capacities. We pray that you would strengthen them for these days. We pray that you would enable their health, if it be your will, and their bodies so that they can serve you with all their strength, so that they can have minds that are alert to your goodness and your ways, so that they can speak the truths of your gospel to others. But Lord, even if our bodies are feeble and our minds are failing, may you be praised. Even, Lord, should we see more accusations and more threats envelop the churches, Lord, may we stand fast and firm in your truth and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we're going to take a 10-minute break now, and then we will come back for our next session. So we'll see you in 10 minutes.
Let us stand together. Our next speaker is Dr. Lance Quinn. From 1986 to 1996, Lance served on the pastoral staff at Grace Community Church in Los Angeles. For many years, he was Dr. MacArthur's personal assistant and was the senior associate pastor there. More recently, he served as senior pastor of Bethany Church in Thousand Oaks, California, before he just recently joined the Expositor Seminary as vice president. In fact, uh, just a few weeks ago, 
that transition was made. Two things I would mention about Lance. One, I can't tell you how many times in the years that I've known Lance, uh, people have sought him out for counsel. I mean, friends of mine, pastor, pastor friends of mine, seeking Lance out for counsel. When you find someone who is consistently sought out for counsel, you're, you're usually dealing with someone who's wise. And that's true with Lance. The second thing I would say is, watch how someone suffers. And in March of 2020, uh, Lance's dear wife, Beth, went to be with the Lord. Uh, she had cancer. And to watch how Lance and his entire family walked through that, uh, to see how Beth walked through it, but then to see how Lance has walked through that has been a testimony to all of us who know him and love him as Christ has shined in and through his life. So it is a great pleasure of mine to have him here this weekend. Um, he has walked through the things he's going to be teaching us about from God's Word. And you welcome Lance Quinn as he comes to share with us God's Word. Well, thank you so very much, my dear brother. For those of you who are members of this church, you are greatly blessed. Not only for your pastor, but for those of you who have served us so ably and so well for this conference, I want to extend my gratitude. I know every one of you wants to extend your gratitude as well for how well we have been served. As Pastor Richard mentioned, it has been a trial for me of epic proportions. When the title, A Humble Perspective of Suffering, was suggested for me, it was one that I certainly have been walking through with the Lord humbling me and encouraging me, it seems that in the decade of my 50s, now into my early 60s, this decade of the 50s were years of great, intense trial and humbling and suffering. The Lord has chosen in the very first year of that decade, my 50th year of life, just sort of cresting into that particular decade, and through the next 12 years of my life, will be uh, 62 in June, this decade has seen six of my very close family members die. Averaging, of course, just about one every other year. First was my stepfather. I didn't live with him. I was older and already gone. My parents having been divorced when I was four years of age, never having grown up with a father. My mother had been married three times before, and she had become a Jehovah's Witness, and she was struggling greatly. She was very angry and volatile, and my growing up years were quite difficult. But she found in this man a, a marriage that lasted longer than any of her marriages, and he died. I appreciated him in so many ways, though I didn't live with him. And that was right as that decade of my 50s was beginning. And then on a Christmas day of 2016, I received a call. I'll never forget it. I was about to head to church. That particular Sunday was Christmas Day. 
and I received news that my mother had died very suddenly of a heart attack while she was in the hospital. She was having a procedure, she was having some other health matters, and apparently in the middle of the night, she had a heart attack, and they found her the next morning. She did not know the Lord. And then, as Pastor Richard mentioned, my wife had been diagnosed with stage 4B non-smoker lung cancer in December of 2017. And as we were going through that process with her, all of her care, and she and I were doing everything we could to shepherd each other and love each other and, and serve each other. And we were rejoicing in the fact that she and I have eight children together. And one of those married couples, my oldest son and his wife, were rejoicing in the birth of a second child. He was a little bit premature, but doing very, very well. And he was in our area he was in the NICU unit of uh, our local hospital just a few minutes from my house, and he was doing well, and they wanted to care for him by putting a pick line into his little body just to give him a little bit added nourishment so he could gain a little weight, but he was doing incredibly well. This was in 2018, and inexplicably, at least on the human level, the pick line that they chose to put into him for that nourishment was not completely sanitized. And so with the bacteria, it went systemic through his little body at day four, and he died on day six. And it was tough for me because, obviously, we were caring for my wife and she was going through her own crucible of experience and obviously was very discouraged about that little boy. And then, of course, with my wife struggling as she was, though we were getting good scan reports um, for over two years, she had had a number of surgeries. She was constantly on chemotherapy but was a trooper. We had sweet people ministering to us, Phil and Darlene Johnson, who were wonderful to us. We've known each other for almost 40 years now. And others, John and Patricia MacArthur, had ministered to us and came to the hospital near the end of her life, really just two days before she died. And Beth was a, a sweetheart so very godly, so very wonderful in a hundred different ways. Our children and, of course, myself adored her. She didn't know anything was going on, nothing. No health challenges that we knew of. She was an active mother and grandmother. In fact, in those growing up years with our eight kids, I don't remember a time I ever saw her take a nap, which has to be, I think, a Guinness Book of World Records or something, <laughs> given the number of those children. So it was around Thanksgiving of 2017. I remember some of our kids came back from uh, where they're living. Uh, six of my children are right around me in that California area, or at least were, and some of the others came uh, flying in. and. So we're playing a board game on Thanksgiving, and she wore glasses, but she couldn't see the board game cards. Well, we sort of owed that to the idea that she had just gotten trifocals. And they said, you're going to have some headaches, your, your eyes are going to need to adjust to the trifocal lenses. So... Um, it's going to be like that. You'll probably have some headaches. And so she did have some of those experiences, but we thought, well, it's, it's the glasses. It's the new glasses. And then, of course, about three weeks later, 
on December 2nd of 2017 with an incredibly healthy woman. I was preaching in Baltimore, Maryland, and I received that call that you never want to get. Two of my daughters, one of whom was going to be married uh, one week from that day, called and said, Dad, something's, something's wrong with Mom. We don't know what it is, but she's, she's obviously hurting, and what should we do? And I said, well, let's take her to the emergency room immediately. And so we did, and they did some scans and said, we're so very sorry. We see a, a massive lump on the left lobe of your lung, and it is obviously metastasized already to the brain. We're, we're so sorry. And when Beth called me to tell me that, I was, of course, quite devastated. So I took a plane in the middle of the night and sat in the back of the plane. It was hardly any passengers on it, and I just cried my eyes out. And then when I got to the airport in Los Angeles, one of my sons picked me up, and we hardly spoke because we couldn't. He dropped me off at the hospital, and I went into her room, and I hugged her, and we just both cried and cried and cried. We knew how bleak the prognosis was, but the Lord gave us two years and four months together. And then on March 1st, I could tell she was not feeling well at all, even though we'd gotten good scan results. But the cancer had gone to another place and it was attacking her spinal fluid. The doctor said there are three very terrible things about this. I hate to tell you. Number one, this leptomeningeal carcinomatosis has no cure. It's also incredibly painful. We'll try to keep her as sedated as we can and finally... Lancet has a two- to four-week mortality. So she will probably die by the end of this month. And of course, as you all know, COVID hit right in the middle of that month. And for the two weeks of the rest of that month, she was in hospice care in the hospital. And that was our opportunity to try to say goodbye. And there was an occasion where she did everything she could in terms of her health and her stamina to give a charge to all of the eight children one by one. And so when my beloved wife died, I was assuming that that might be the greatest trial in my life, and of course it has been. But less than three months later, I got a call from my niece about my sister, my only sister. She said, have you talked with my mom lately? And I said, well, I've been trying to reach out to her, but she hasn't been responding. And she said, that's because she's in the hospital and she's about to die. I said, with what? And she said, well, you know, she smokes and she's been secretly drinking and she's smoking and drinking herself to death and she's got about a week to live not a believer. And so over the next year, based on all the COVID issues, we were struggling to be able to do not only a memorial service for her, but also a memorial service for my wife. And we were able to do a memorial service for my sister in Arkansas, the state in which I grew up, which happened to be on the very day of what would have been her 61st birthday. And then nine months after my wife died on March 30th, we were able to finally have, because of those onerous restrictions in California about COVID, a memorial service for her. And no sooner had that occurred than I received a call that my favorite aunt had also just died. So in the space of these 12 years, My stepfather, my mother, my grandson, my wife, my sister, and my aunt have all died. 
And you know, when you're in a season like this, an extended season, a long season, a season of over a decade, you you begin to pour over the Scriptures, especially as a pastor. And you ask the question, why? Why, Lord? What, what's the point? What's the reason? Why, why all of this? In one sense, it's natural. And of course, even psalmists, so many of them ask why of the Lord. And for me, I looked at all of these experiences, and particularly the one with my wife. And it made me look at several of the passages of Scripture that I'm sure you know well, like the book of Ecclesiastes. In chapter 1, it says, The words of the preacher, you know, the wise old sage, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but earth remains forever. I just fixated on that phrase, a generation comes, a generation goes. Or as Phil Johnson quoted earlier this morning, Psalm 90 You return man to dust, Moses says, and you return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed, in the evening it fades and withers. And then Moses says, the years of our life are 70, or even if by reason of strength 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Or maybe even the text that I've chosen for this afternoon, turn in your Bibles to Psalm 39. Psalm 39. We'll get there, but verses 4. 4, 5, and 6 say this, O Lord, make me know my end, and what is the measure of my days? Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few handbreadths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath, Selah. Surely a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. When you contemplate the the brevity and the fragility of life, you do indeed so quickly realize that life is so fleeting. My wife was 57 years old. We'd been together for over 34 years, 35, including our dating time, and I miss her terribly. It just didn't seem like it was long enough. King David is is right to ask Yahweh, to allow him to understand that this life is so swiftly ending. And I think, therefore, we should, in comparison with God's own existence, admit it. We are so transitory, and He is eternal. I think that's why the title is is well taken, a humble perspective of suffering, a humble perspective. I mean, in light of who God is, eternal, and in light of who I am, temporal, at least in this short stay on the earth, it just forces humility on us. If I were to outline 
Psalm 39, it, it could be the, and I didn't even know what Phil Johnson was going to teach this morning. He's done the New Testament version of the four B's. I want to do the Old Testament version of the four C's from Psalm 39. Be careful, be clear, be contrite, and be consistent. Be careful, be clear, be contrite, be consistent. Listen to what David says here to the choir master, to Jedithan, a psalm of David. I said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle so long as the wicked are in my presence. I was mute and silent. I held my peace to no avail, and my distress grew worse. My heart became hot within me as I mused. The fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue, O oh Lord, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few handbreadths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Selah. That's undoubtedly a musical term that says, keep the music going, but no words now so that you can ponder. Like a musical interlude. Surely, verse 6, a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. And now, O oh Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. I am mute. I do not open my mouth, for it is you who have done it. Remove your stroke from me. I am spent by the hostility of your hand. When you discipline a man with rebukes for sin, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. Surely all mankind is a mere breath. Selah. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my tears, for I am a sojourner with you, a guest like all my fathers. Look away from me that I may smile again before I depart and am no more. This is a psalm that I came across in the crucible of those 12 years of agony. And of course, this isn't the only one. It seems like the psalms have been my dear friend for a long, long time. They seem so raw so real, so transparent, so instructive, so convicting. And the reason I've outlined it with these four C's is because I think it really gives the essence of this biblical text, this psalm, in a way that I trust will be very, very encouraging for you. Let's look at the first one. Be careful. Be careful. Well, be careful about what? Well, I think you and I ought to be careful to whom and just how you and I talk about life's difficulties, especially to unbelievers. Be careful to whom and just how you and I talk about life's difficulties, especially with unbelievers. I think that's what David is after here. He's essentially saying, be careful to have a humble attitude about your suffering and trials given this very, very short life. And be very careful about how you talk about God to unbelievers. He says in verse 1, I said, I will guard my ways 
that I may not sin with my tongue. And notice this, I will guard my mouth with a muzzle so long as the wicked are in my presence. Seems to me to be clear that in the context of this psalm, David is being chastised by the Lord due to his sin. Now that's going to come to us in verses 8, 9, 10, and 11. But here, at least he has the presence of mind to withhold his words, even if there's something in his heart that you and I could say he needs to repent of. But at least, especially with unbelievers, he's muzzling his mouth. And I take it because King David understands and knows and affirms that they are our mission field. And we need to be careful about how we represent God to them. Be careful, particularly among unbelievers, how you represent God's ways and God's means. And don't think if you're talking instead to believers, you can uh, say anything cross about the Lord that you would not want to say to unbelievers, right? But be especially extra careful with unbelievers because your desire is to win them to your God. I mean, even in the midst of David's questions, including a He is asking out loud about God's hand of chastisement, and that's going to come in this psalm. His commitment is steadfast to be very, very careful about how he represents God, particularly to the unbelieving world. I mean, what a commitment to watching your words and seeking to represent the reputation of your God before a watching, unbelieving world. I think that's something that uh, the Christian community ought to be very careful of in these days, especially in these days of social media. You want even in an hour of severe discipline or suffering to make sure that you're humble and not the reverse so that people, especially outsiders, don't assume that as believers, you and I can mock God for what he does in our lives. Or at least question it in a way that crosses a line. Now, you and I know that in the Psalms, there are those psalmists who say, how long, O Lord, right? And why? And when? And how? But the way they do it is different than the idea of mocking God. And being someone who's questioning the very goodness of God, the very nature of God, we have to be careful with this. And of course, it's true that because of the intense pain and sorrow of suffering, believers can most certainly sound as though they think God in bringing to his people what he does an arbitrary and capricious element in our lives. We are questioning. And if you're like me, with six deaths in seemingly rapid-fire succession, one about every other year, Lord, why? Why? What's, what's, What's the reason? What's the point? Why the, why the scourge? Why the, the testing? What, What am I doing? What have I done? I think there's something very natural to that, but be careful that you don't slip into a mode of saying, and I hold you responsible for all of this. And I think you are just arbitrary and capricious, and certainly if you're saying that in the midst of a few unbelievers, they might say, yeah, and I've got some other things I'd like to tell him. I think this is a great warning to say, be careful. Be careful what and how you speak to the Lord. And especially when there's an audience of unbelievers. So what does David do? Look at verse 2. In verse 3, he says, I was mute and silent. Remember, this is in the audience of 
unbelief. I was mute and silent. I held my peace. Maybe that's where we get that phrase, right? Hold your peace. I held my peace. And notice, to no avail. And my distress grew worse. My heart became hot within me. As I mused, as I thought about this idea of trials, suffering, scourgings, discipline, whatever it may be, when I mused, the Bible here says the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Well, what did he say? Well, O oh Lord, make me know my end. Now, I would have assumed it might have been something entirely different. I mean, you're trying to rightly represent God to unbelievers and you want to be able instead to say, now look, I think you've got a wrong view of God. I think when you call him arbitrary and capricious, that he's not a good God, why do bad things happen to good people even though you and I know there aren't any good people? Let's start at the right anthropological point here. But it seems as though David is speaking about something else when he says in Verse 4, O oh Lord, make me know my end. I would assume then that he's talking about something else, and that's our second point. And that is be clear. Be clear. Not only be careful just what you say and how you say it, particularly to, un to unbelievers, but also if you're burning within you, my heart became hot within me, verse 3 says, and I mused as I thought about things. The fire burned. In other words, it wasn't lessening, it was gaining. Then I spoke with my tongue, and what did you say? O oh Lord, verse 4, make me know my end. What is the measure of my days? Let me know how fleeting I am. I see humility in that. I see humility in that. Now, what's he trying to be clear about? I think he's trying to be clear about the fact that mankind's life is utterly short. Maybe you could say it this way. How do we conduct ourselves even as we live in a very, very short lifespan? How do we conduct ourselves? I mean, do we have a humble attitude which acknowledges my transitory life in comparison with an eternal Sovereign God. I mean, I see David as speaking humbly of that which he's suffering. I mean, you've got to be clear. You've got to be clear about what you're saying to everybody, particularly unbelievers. But you also have to be careful about that which is happening in your life. Everybody's going to have those night watches. I've, I've had many of them in just a few weeks. It will be the two-year mark of my wife's death, and I've just made this ministry move, and I've moved into a new home, and it's in a place, a new place, where when I pillow my head at night, it's very, very dark and very, very quiet. And I've got to be careful. Because in the night watches, when I'm only hearing the sound of my own prayer life, I don't want to indict the sovereign. Question his goodness. Ask him why, why, why? Just, just last week, one of my daughters, six of my eight children are married, they have growing families, 12 grandchildren now. And she has three, and she was having a hard time. Her husband, who's a youth pastor in the church that I just left, was gone on a youth retreat, and she had sick kids, all three of them. 
Same time, you know what that's like, ladies? And she sent up a flare. She called her dad, which is uh, not particularly always helpful. <laughs> you know why? Because I said everything I thought I knew how to say with compassion and love, and I prayed with her, and I said, I know how tough it is, sweetheart. And she said, I just want to talk to mom. I just want to talk to my mom. And this is a young lady who's got three kids. She's older. She's, she's wanting to do the right thing. She wants to respond. She wants to do what the Lord would want her to do. But there are just those times in the night watches when everything seems to be going the opposite of how you would want it. And she just wanted to talk to her mom. And when you have scenarios like that, you, you say to yourself, Lord. So after I got off the phone with her, I <coughs> cried and, and said, Lord, I am such a cheap substitute. Why didn't you take me? Why didn't you, you have her stay, especially for those, those girls? I have five daughters and three sons, and now three daughters-in-law. I can't relate to them like she can. Take me. Don't take her. I may be the head of our home, but she's the neck that turns the head. I told, I told our congregation who loved us, persevered with us through that very severe trial, I may, be the, I may be the head, but Beth was the backbone in that family. Well, you can, you can say those kinds of things in the night watches, but be careful that you don't transgress a line that impugns the character of God, the goodness of God, the plan of God, the will of God. And I think for David right here, he says, here's what I know. I don't know a lot of things. I'm, I'm running from Saul continually. I'm trying to lead this country. What, whatever's going on, we don't know anything about this particular psalm. Maybe it's flattened out for us because it's a way to apply in all occasions. But we do know this. Whatever he's doing in the night watches, he's saying, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. And then he says, you've made our days just like a few hand breaths. You say, what are hand breaths? You know what they are? The breadth of your hand. So you put your hand out and you put either your thumb or your first finger and you measure it toward your pinky and it's maybe three inches, four inches. That's the equivalent of our quote-unquote long life. That's it. Here's another way the scripture speaks of our fleeting life. <sighs> that was it. <laughs> By comparison, that was it. And then I want you to notice here in verses 4, 5, and 6, he says in verse 5, Behold, you have made my days a few hand breaths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Surely a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Do you notice three surelys there? That's not a woman's name. That's, that's a way of speaking what appears to be self-evident truth. Axiomatic statements. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Surely a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up will, uh, wealth and does not know who will gather. You've heard that hackneyed phrase. You've never seen a hearse carrying a U-Haul. I mean, who's going to own? Remember Jesus in the Gospels? When a man was... was 
building up his company, and he said, look, I've got so much produce, I've got to build bigger barns. And Jesus said to him, you fool! Your soul is required of you tonight, and who will own what you possess? That's, that's what David's saying. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. The answer is somebody, but you won't be in control of it. I mean, where do you go when you start to inquire about life's troubling circumstances? David's answer is, if, if you're assuming that that part of your answer might be a complaint against God for his dealing with you, David says, no way. It sounds like Job, doesn't it? And it sounds like the Lord responding to Job, who had countless troubles and challenges and vicissitudes of life. And when it comes time for God, who never really particularly answers his question, does say, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Do you want to contend with the Almighty? That just sort of puts us in our place. And I, I can hear unbelievers, and I, that's why I don't like that. No one's going to put me in my place. No one's going to tell me what to do. I'll just do what I well please. I'm the captain of my own destiny. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I want, and then when I die, there's just non-existence. Well, David knows that is not true. And he says, you and I as human beings are the ones who are fleeting. God is sovereign. God is in control. We are not. We are transitory. He's eternal. We are all about caring for ourselves, our wealth, attempting to amass enough of the world's riches, or we want to take care of all of our loved ones. We want to make sure that they are safe. And David says, you're not in charge of any of that. God is in charge. Oh, and by the way, in other Psalms, and of course what we know by revelation of the New Testament, God's not only sovereign, He's not only in charge, but He's also good. That's Psalm 119.68a. God is good and does good. I don't know how many times I lay in bed at night in the night watches and just say that over and over and over again to a good God who does good things. He can be trusted. I think those surely's, by the way, are humility statements. Verse 4a, in humility, let me know how fleeting I am. Verse 5, my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely, surely, surely. I mean, if we measure ourselves against the person of Yahweh, we find that we ought to say, this is pretty clear. This is pretty clear. And that's what David wants you to conclude. Be clear. Be careful and be clear. And thirdly, be contrite. Be contrite. How are we going to be contrite? Well, this is actually where I think the, the central proposition of this psalm gives us great insight. Verse 7, And now, O Lord, for what do I wait? And then notice the next phrase, My hope is in you. My hope is in you. And if you stopped right there, you would assume that King David, up to that point, is speaking in a way that he's almost like an apologist. He's an apologist for a couple of things. Life is fleeting. God is sovereign. Don't speak a word against God or about God like he's arbitrary or capricious with unbelievers and on and on as we've already discussed. And you and I would say, boy, that's a pretty effective apologist. 
He's, he's talking about the doctrine of God, and he's representing God in a way that you and I would applaud and say, yes, that's the right kind of apologetic defense. But I think it goes deeper there because the next verse says this, verse 8, deliver me from all my what? Transgressions. You see, that's why I believe there's something under the surface here. David is not wanting to speak to unbelievers something that isn't true about God, but he's still burning. The fire burns, verse 3. He finally does speak with his tongue, but what does he do? What does he say? What's happening? Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. I think he's probably saying, I'm really, really tempted to say that you're not treating me well or as you otherwise should. And maybe, maybe not in the unbeliever's presence, but maybe in his heart, maybe upon his bed in the night watches, he crosses the line and he knows he's transgressed against the Lord. He said what he was really thinking. He was hot and bothered. The fire burned. My heart became hot within me, and he transgressed against the Lord. And you know, that is something that we can do, right? We can do that. All of us can. We've done it. He says in verse 9, I am mute. I do not open my mouth, for it is you who have done it. And now he's talking about what I think the Lord did in response to his transgressions, and he started disciplining him. He started disciplining him. And that's why I say that this section, he's got to be contrite. In your approach to the sovereign God, you transgress with your mouth, you, you say whatever it is that you're going to say, and God has to, in a fatherly way, but in an unmistakable way, deal with all of us. He takes us to the spiritual woodshed. No wonder it says, Selah. Pause, ponder this. And so the Lord has disciplined him. We know that from Hebrews 12, don't we? I mean, it doesn't seem this discipline joyful for the moment, but afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. We're going into the school of discipline. And so he is disciplined. We know that because when he says in verse 10, remove your stroke from me, I am spent by the hostility of your hand. And I know unbelievers would certainly say, look, if you've got a God for whom you say the hostility of his hand is upon me, the stroke... I want nothing to do with him because all I want is to live on easy street. But we know as believers, and we've heard time and time and time again in this conference that the Lord uses those strokes to bring us to new vistas of understanding about who he is and about what he wants from us and to mold and shape us into the very image of Jesus Christ. So he says in verse 11, when you discipline a man with rebukes for sin, now he calls what's going on in his life sin. Transgressions, verse 8, sin, verse 11, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. I take that to mean like a moth who gets close to the flame, you just burn the dross away. You just take the transgressions and the sin of my heart and you deal with them. No wonder he says, surely all mankind is mere breath. This is a lament psalm, and so David is expressing his contrition, his repentance. He, he's repenting of his, of his attitude and, and of his words, and it may not be with an unbeliever, but it certainly in, is in his heart. And it could be with even the believing community, and sometimes you and I have it, as a pastor, I've counseled for 40 years, and I'll hear it from either my 
members of my own congregation or others who come to see me and we have to go to the woodshed. We have to talk. We have to, to grapple with all of these things. We have, to, we have to talk about the attitudes of the human heart and we have to work on the ideas of transgressions and sins and discipline and rebukes. It's all here. So you've got to be very clear and you've got to be very careful and for all of us, even in our fleeting life, we have to be contrite. We have to live a life of repentance, even in terms sometimes of our attitudes. And this is in no way saying that you and I can't go to the Lord and say, Lord, help me, help me, I'm struggling. I don't, I don't want these circumstances in my life. What, what are they designed to do? Why is this something that I need? Help me. And if you cross the line and if you indict the Lord and if you ask the Lord as though you're demanding an answer and that he has to, in that demanding of an answer, change the scenario to your liking, you've crossed the line. Transgression, sin. And you have to say, Lord, I guess I'm going to have to be disciplined. And I remember with eight children, when my oldest daughter was a senior in high school, my eighth and final daughter was in the first grade. That was the span. And they hardly ever liked it when, as dad came home, mom gave the report. And here was the worst news of all. Go meet with your father in his office. And it was, it was a time for another sermon from dad. And the comeuppance came with the rod of reproof so that that foolishness would be driven far from them. Be contrite, fourthly and last. Be consistent. Be consistent. Be careful, be clear, be contrite, and be consistent. Look at verses 12 and 13. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my tears, for I am a sojourner with you, a guest like all my fathers. Here's another recognition of the fleeting life we all have. I'm a sojourner with you, a guest like all my fathers. We're all going to die. We all live a short life. Look away from me, verse 13, that I may smile again before I depart and am no more. What does he mean Hold not your peace at my tears, verse 12, and look away from me that I may smile again. Well, be consistent about your ongoing requests to him for grace and peace. Grace and peace. And don't you love that about our God? That even with all the discipline, even with all the instruction, even with all the confusion in my heart and my mind about life and about its fleeting nature and about struggle and about death, we can always go to him and say, give ear to my cry, hear my prayer. Hold not your peace at my tears. I, I need, even through my tears, the peace of God. Please, Please, Lord, give me a mountain of peace in the midst of my tears. I take this as assurance, tranquility, help, hope, peace, peace that passes all understanding. I don't get this. I don't understand this trial. I don't know what's going on. Help me, help me, help me. 
But whatever I do, even in my transgressions and my sins and my shortcomings in this fleeting life, hold not your peace at my tears. And then when he says, look away from me that I may smile again, I think look away from me means this. Would you consider allowing me to leave the spiritual woodshed? Would you forestall your discipline for the moment and smile at me again? You know, when I discipline those kids, just like Hebrews 12 says, what, what father is there who doesn't discipline his children? And, and if those children don't have any discipline, it's inevitably meaning that they are illegitimate sons and not true sons and daughters. So if you are, as a human parent, disciplining your kids, it's for a purpose. And so in that purpose, when they came to the office and they knew they were going to get the rod, I always tried to maintain after the experience of the woodshed, I love you, I care for you, I'm your dad, and this is hard, but God is good. I'm very thankful that all Eight of my children profess to know Christ. And, and I, I think part of it is because whenever it was the worst of the worst and I knew I was going to get the rod of reproof, that I wanted to, as soon as that was over to hug them and say, I love you, I care about you, and I have to do this because God not only commands it, but because it's for your good. And I saw them lighten up and run to hug me and put their arms around me because they saw what appeared to them to be the restoring of the relationship to one of hugs and kisses and not discipline in the rod because that's what they wanted. And when he says, look away from me that I may smile again before I depart and am no more, I think that's David as a personified as a little boy who's looking up at his heavenly father and saying, hey, before I die, before I'm done, before there's no more David, I just want to make sure that I can see your smile. I want to make sure that that peace, that peace and grace, that smile and affirmation is going to be there. I think that's what Jesus is for us. Jesus was careful never to blame his heavenly father for the suffering in his life. He was careful. Jesus was clear. He was perfectly clear about the brevity of life. And he was always urging men and women to repent and believe in the gospel, even as he maximized himself a life and then death in his mid to late 30s, how can I question my Lord Jesus Christ taking my wife at 57 when his life was taken in his mid to late 30s? I can't just arbitrarily say that's not fair. Some, some couples get to have their 50th anniversary and their 60th and their 70th. Our God allowed his son to give his life as a ransom for many at a very early age. It's a fleeting life. And Jesus bore our sin in his own body on the tree and atonement for our utter need to be contrite. He, he took our sin upon himself and Jesus was utterly consistent in his own bringing to us our needed grace and peace. And why? Because he is our peace. Oh, my friends, I hope you'll never, ever read Psalm 39 the same way again. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, Thank you for the opportunity to have some meditation 
on a psalm, a song, a song to sing, a, a portion of Scripture that catches us up so short because life is short. And I pray that for me especially and for these, my dear friends, that when we come close to not being as careful and clear and contrite and consistent as we ought to be, that we would take your discipline upon ourselves and then ask you to bring back again your smile and your peace. Father, it never means that we're not restored. We have a relationship with you, but the restoration is due to that fatherly discipline. It's, it's never that we're out of the kingdom. It's never that we're no longer in Christ, but, but this discipline means that when we're transgressing and sinning, we'll need your fatherly love and the hand of your discipline to make sure that we're on the path as fleeting as it is. May we ask you for more peace and for more grace and for your smiling countenance upon us for the honor and for the sake of our Lord and Savior who took all of that upon himself so that we might be conform to his image, and in whose name we pray. Amen. What a rich walk through the 39th Psalm. And thank you, Lance, for your transparency as you walked us through your own experience as well. Have you been blessed today? It's been a rich day already, hasn't it? We're going to take a dinner break now. Uh, The doors will be open again at 5.30 for the bookstore and just for you to find a place. Um, And then tonight we have Dr. Stephen Lawson and we have Paul Washer who will be preaching. So you don't want to uh, be absent. Once again, I would ask that you take all of your things with you as you leave. Between sessions, we need to do that. And we'll see you back here at 530. God bless.